Welcome to Eclecticist. Eclecticist is an investigation of everything from a very British perspective by two brothers who are reasonably okay guys, and we do this one topic at a time. We are me, Jeffrey Campos, an engineer and devil's advocate, and Benjamin de Campos, a designer and believer. We typically choose a topic which we think we need to know a little bit more about, we spend a little bit of time researching it, we have a discussion, and we publish the notes. We think that this fosters a greater understanding of the world, um, and hopefully gives us a better understanding of exactly where we are in the world before we die, and it prompts further thought and discussion from our listeners. The topic we're wrestling with today will be dinosaurs. Over 200 million years ago, terrestrial and oceanic reptiles known collectively as dinosaurs appeared and dominated Earth's fauna for approximately 135 million years. Fueled by lush forests, warm temperatures, and conducive atmosphere, the diversity of clade dinosauria ranged from rodent-sized carnivores, building-sized herbivores, seafaring goliaths, and airborne hunters. Contemporaneous for much of their reign with birds and mammals, environmental changes conspired to tilt the balance of power towards these competitors, ending the dinosaurs' dominance and ultimately leading to their extinction. What do we know about the epoch in which they lived? What is the appeal of their enduring legacy, and will we ever see their like again? We won't be talking about Godzilla or Rod Stewart. So, what does dinosaur mean to you? Dinosaur to me means large, scaly lizards, um, which we know might not have actually been the case, which we should talk about. It's a moving target. I always thought they were big, scaly lizards, but in fact, they could, for the most part, have been small, feathered reptiles. <laughs> not lizards at all. Even though the uh, they were originally discovered by, um, we should say, William Buckland in 1824, he discovered some fossil bones of what he later called the Megalosaurus. And uh, dinosaur, the name, was coined by Sir Richard Owen, which basically means roughly terrible lizard, but evidently that's not exactly what he really meant. He just thought they were fabulous, and he wanted to call them fabulous sort of lizards, even though we now know they weren't lizards, really. They were reptiles. Uh, but uh, I, I've always thought of them um, as large, scaly, uh, mostly from pictures because pictures on books uh, about dinosaurs will always have a Tyrannosaurus rex or an Allosaurus or a Stegosaurus or a Triceratops on the front. You never see a Trudon or a Theropod, the much smaller little dinosaurs on the fronts of books, because size impresses. Yeah, um, I'm not 100% sure of the data there. I thought uh, dinosaurs were discovered in 16-something. Well, no doubt people have tripped over exposed dinosaur fossils you know I mean, it must have happened it's just the first time someone actually categorized their finding and inserted it into the phylogenetic tree uh you know classification first started in 1824 with william buckland i think but no doubt entire fossilized skeletons were discovered before that and uh burned uh, because they were monsters who knows but certainly it was a long time ago uh but again the first classification was by this british um paleontologist i suppose you could call him uh way back in 1824 and uh, he discovered of course a fossilized bones so this is something that i've always been confused by you know what are fossils when i was a kid i remember dinosaur bones and seeing dinosaur bones in museums and thinking wow dinosaur bones but in fact they are not dinosaur bones they are stone the bones have long since vanished and uh, were simply replaced by the process of fossilization which i think is fairly amazing and i think one of the reasons why or certainly one of the reasons why we are so used to seeing dinosaurs as very large animals is because the larger the dinosaur i think the higher the probability that it would fossilize 
all the little tiny bird-like dinosaurs, which were the vast majority, um, didn't fossilize. Simple as that. They were too delicate, too fragile, and they just were not preserved. So when they are found, it's ultra rare. Which is kind of odd, considering that, like now, back then, the larger the animal, the more rare, or rather less common it was. I mean, today we have the elephants and the bison and giraffes, and they're super de duper rare. It's much more common to see very small animals, little man mammals and rodents and rats and what have you. And I think the same was true then, but because of fossilization, it seems as though uh, we have more um, larger animals preserved, which is queer. But So it really was a, an epoch of bugs and bacteria, just like it is now. So an alien watching this planet from afar would probably think not much has changed, really. Hmm. In well, terms of actual living organisms. 135 million years, you said in your introduction. Gosh, that's a long time, considering us humans have only been moping around for like 100,000 years. Yeah, they may, they may never have disappeared had, were it not for a very unfortunate incident with a large rock that ha yes. happened to find the Earth at great speed. At the Yucatan Peninsula. Indeed. So it, what is it, 100,000 years that humans have been um, have been around? Is that the, the latest? Yeah, number? I think that the most generous allowance there in our reasonably close to our current form is something like 400,000 years, but it goes all the way down to... 100,000 years, which is just a drop in the ocean in terms of um, uh, time. Uh, the, I forget the no, the word that uh, geochronology, geochronological time. Yeah, it's a drop in the ocean. Uh, but fossils, uh, again, dinosaurs um, have been discovered. We know that dinosaurs lived uh, at the time that they lived in the uh, Mesozoic era. Uh, we know they existed, and they no longer exist, because we find their remains in the ground as fossils. And as I've said, fossils are stone stones in the shape of the bones, because there's a process whereby crystals and rocky materials replace the bones uh, when the animal has been covered in dust and dirt, in sedimentary layers of rock. Uh, and then these uh, these fossil bones are exposed by erosion, uh, wind and water erosion of the ground, or they are pushed to the surface by volcanic um, uh, processes, or they are discovered by actively digging into the ground and finding and exposing these uh, bones. And the bones are the from the dead carcasses of the dinosaurs, so they will. You know, they could be in lots of different conformations. They could be upside down. They could be right side up. They could be scattered. They, you know, they could, they could have been compressed or stretched. Um, there's all sorts of different ways uh, in conformations that you can find the fossils in. But what really always amazed me is how the scientists could work out how old these remains are. How, how do you know we're talking about millions of years and not thousands of years? or not billions of years, you know, how do you know this? Uh, and I always thought it's simply down to sedimentation and how, you know, the layers of dust and dirt have uh, precipitated and built up and compacted. And you have the, the geologic column. So you have the different layers of sedimentary rock. And that'll give you an idea. If, if you know the rate at which the sedimentation occurred, you might be able to determine how long something has been buried given the depth that they are buried at. But in fact, it's radiometric dating that's used. So we're all familiar with uh, radiocarbon dating. Um, radiocarbon is an isotope of carbon. Carbon is an, an element. It's an atom uh, that has six neutrons in it. Um, and radiocarbon is a sort of a variant of the normal carbon that you find. It has an extra two neutrons. Uh, and it's naturally occurring, uh, but it disappears when living organisms are no longer breathing. So if you have a, a tree that is um, respiring and it's absorbing carbon dioxide in, in an exchange process, if it stops doing that, 
when it's dead, then the amount of radiocarbon in its tissues starts to dwindle in a sort of radioactive decay process. And uh, there's a half-life. Half-life is the amount of time it takes before something reduces down to half its volume. But it's only 5,000 years for radiocarbon, five, 6,000 years. Uh, so that's no good for dinosaurs. That only allows you to date things that are about 6,000 years old, which is good for human remains, uh, but no good for anything that existed uh, far um, longer into the mist of time, like dinosaurs. That, that's all you need, though, 6,000 years. Yeah, well, you'd think, and, and, and a lot of people did think that and probably still do think that. But in fact, um, the scientists are using the same radiometric principles of half-lives and and whatnot, but they're doing it with uh, different elements, elements that have uh, the isotopes of elements that have much longer half-lives, uh, potassium and uranium. So I think it's potassium-40 and definitely uranium-238 uh, and 235, I think. Uh, so these, these compounds have half-lives in millions of years. But there's a big problem. The problem is, is that even though these elements, are isotopes, are naturally occurring, they do not occur in sedimentary rock, where we find dinosaur fossils. Dinosaur fossils happen when dirt covers the skeletons of the animals. There are two different major groups of rocks. We have sedimentary rocks, which is dust layers, and then we have igneous rocks, which are formed through volcanic activity. There are no fossils in volcanic activity because a... Vol volcanically formed rock, an igneous rock, is formed from molten rock. No bones could possibly um, withstand the heat and the, the movement of a rapidly cooling um, block of magma. Therefore, um, the long, half-lived elements must exist in the sedimentary rock, and unfortunately they do not. You will only find these elements in igneous rock. So then we have a problem. The way they do it is that they'll find some fossils in a layer or a stratum of sedimentary rock, and then they will look to see if there are igneous rocks that have formed in the same layer. If they're lucky enough to find that, then they can date the igneous rock, and that, by dint of the fact that it's in the same layer, uh, they can date the fossils. And I think that's the primary tool they use to date fossils. I think there's a lot of room for error there, and I think you know we really do have to defer to the experts on a lot of this. But uh, that's how they do it, and they, you know there are other indicators and other means uh, to work things out. I think there's some work with uh, magnetism and uh, other other ways uh, to date. And I think the more methods they have in their arsenal, the more accurate uh, the dates will be. But um, they really have dated these fossils to millions of years ago, and they're very clear on uh, the, the general uh, date spans between the different eras, I suppose you can call them. Well, all dating methods are based on assumptions. You don't pull fossils up out of the ground that have little labels on them saying that they're X amount years old. It's all man's interpretation. Yeah, I think there's a lot of room for error, sure, for sure. Uh, but basically, Ken Ham and I just disagree uh, with you and the time span that you claim is going on here. Yeah, I, I suppose, I mean, even if you were to um, doubt all of the dating techniques and all of the ages of all of the remains that are found in the ground, the simple fact of the matter is these animals did exist and they no longer exist. Uh, and that's, that's interesting. <laughs> um, we pull skeletons out of the ground and uh, we assemble them. And uh, we have a very amazing creatures in front of us, which with a huge diversity. Um, and I think you know that's that's worthy of uh, study, uh, even if you don't slot it into a, a time scale. And I should just mention that the the time scales we're talking about here, the way the world, the history of the planet is broken up, is broadly into three eras. We have the Paleozoic era, that's all the way up until 250 million years ago. And then there was a massive extinction event. And then we have the Mesozoic era, which started with the Triassic, which is 250 to 200 million years ago. 
uh, so the beginning of the dinosaurs. Then the Jurassic, which is 200 to 145 million years ago, sort of in the middle of the reign of the dinosaurs. And then we have the Cretaceous period, which is 145 million years ago to 65 million years ago, which was the end of the Mesozoic era. And that was uh, demarcated by another massive extinction event in the Yucatan Peninsula. Uh, and then we had the beginning of the Cenozoic era, which is the rise of the mammals and the birds and, and whatnot. Uh, just uh, on the run-up to another huge extinction event, I'm sure, but uh, which has yet to happen. So we have a, a vast spectrum of events and uh, time periods, uh, and uh, the the dinosaurs were roughly in the middle, and and they were around for over a hundred million years, which is astonishing. So if you just imagine all the evolution that occurred during that time, and the the diversity and the the sheer number of individual organisms that must have walked about or swam about or flew about during that period. And then you consider how many fossils we don't have. It just shows you, it gives you an idea of just how incredibly rare uh, a fossil is. Just insanely rare. <laughs> Boy, you are a real glass half empty kind of guy. You keep talking about all the fossils that we don't have. Yes, indeed. I mean, there must be, you know, countless trillions and trillions and trillions of organisms that are just unfortunately did not fossilize owing to the fact that it's so rare. But a couple of weeks ago, I went to um, a place called Walton on the Nazi, and I did some fossil hunting. And there's a lot of London clay. It's uh, on the naze. That's the one. It's, uh, it's at the seaside, and there's large London clay cliffs that are just crumbling away. And uh, there are lots of little um, fossils. There are 20 million year old shark teeth and... Uh, Lots of fossilized wood and all the rest of it. So, you know, it, you can pull these things out. I found a, bit, a couple of bits of um, tropical looking tree bark that was fossilized. So they're stone and uh, you can see the, the bark, you know, the external portion of the tree. And it, it does look tropical. It, it puts you in mind of a sort of like a palm tree. And yet here I was on the coast of England, which is about as far away from any sort of tropical climate you can possibly imagine. So it's amazing to think that things have changed so much. Yes. Going back to what you said about fossils or stones, I meant to look this up, but I forgot. Um, Recently-ish, there were some paleontologists who uh, unearthed some dinosaur fossils, and they broke into one, and they found that it contained, apparently, uh, soft tissues and red blood cells and like this kind of thing. Um, and creationists uh, are making capital out of this, as you would imagine, as it's, to them, incontrovertible truth that dinosaurs uh, lived within 6,000 years. Do you know anything about this? Um, I think, again, the fossilization process, it, it depends how the fossil, the fossilization process first sort of captures the organism. Now, there have been imprints of organisms in stone of feathers. So Archaeopteryx, the feathered dinosaur sort of transitional species, you might say. Uh, you could clearly see the impressions of its wings. Uh, there are lots of plant fossils whereby you see the impressions of very delicate palm fronds. Uh, so it doesn't seem totally outrageous that you might have the fossilization. I mean, it depends on the resolution of the medium, but the fossilization of soft body parts and uh, and maybe even down to the cellular level. I don't think it's impossible, but uh, I, I don't see why that would necessarily mean fossilization took place more recently than than longer ago. So I don't know what the creationists are going on about, but... Uh... You know, there, there are some, there are good fossils, there are bad fossils. There are lots of different ways of fossilization. There are lots of different types of sedimentary rock. Who knows? We might find a fossil imprint of a brain of a diplodocus, perhaps. No idea. But I haven't seen anything in the news particularly about that. Okay. I just pulled this up on the internet. It's from livescience.com. And it goes... The controversial discovery of 68 million year old soft tissue from the bones of a Tyrannosaurus rex finally has a physical explanation. According to new research, iron in the dinosaur's body preserved the tissue before it could decay. Hmm, that sounds interesting. 
the research headed by this person, a molecular, a molecular paleontologist at North Carolina State University, explains how proteins and possibly even DNA can survive millennia. Schweitzer and her colleagues first raised this question in 2005 when they found a seemingly impossible soft tissue preserved inside the leg of an adolescent T-Rex unearthed in Montana. What we found was unusual because it was still soft and still transparent and still flexible, Schweitzer told Life Science. So, yeah, so I mean, they actually do have a scientific explanation for it. And, um, you know, creationists are having a field day. I can't imagine <laughs> actually pulling out soft body tissue from a fossil. That doesn't make any kind of sense to me at all whatsoever. But it's happened. I just read your credible source. Are you denying that? I'm I'm denying that. I'll have to look it up. Okay. Well, let's look it up and you're gonna have to time. edit all this out. I'm I'm absolutely not prepared to get my keyboard out and start <laughs> doing research right now. Absolutely not prepared for that. It's ridiculous. Okay. This sounds like balls to me, but I'm quite happy to add whatever we need to add to the the show notes. But I it's mean, not balls. I mean, I, I wasn't reading from the Answers in Genesis website. No, no soft, ti- no soft body tissue, soft body tissue. Literally, it cannot survive more than a hundred years out of a dead organism. There's no way soft body tissue can survive for millions of, well, even thousands of years, even hundreds of years. It's not possible. It's not going to happen. So you think it's not possible? I see where you're going with this. Um, I, I haven't seen any of the evidence. I haven't seen this at all. Maybe it is. I, I'll have to have a look, but it seems like nonsense to me. So what came before the dinosaurs? Um, we have uh, literally billions of years before the dinosaurs came around. So was there life prior to the dinosaurs? Of course there were. There are lots of... Uh, bugs and uh, lots of uh, very simple sort of single cell creatures there are fish uh, there are crustaceans uh, and there are archosaurs archosaurs are the immediate progenitor to the dinosaurs the dinosaurs the entire clade evolved from archosaurs um, and birds uh, birds also evolved pretty much at the same time as the dinosaurs uh, lots of people believe that dinosaurs are still here. They never went away because look out the window and look at the birds and the birds are the dinosaurs. Hmm. I thought you said a couple of weeks ago that um, you thought you didn't think birds were dinosaurs. No, not at all. I was just about to say that uh, they, weren't, they weren't the dinosaurs. They were contemporaneous with the dinosaurs and they evolved from the theropods, which are a creature obviously the birds evolved from something during the time of the dinosaurs because that's how evolution works and the latest thinking is that they were evolved from the theropods which evolved a branch in the phylogenetic tree that had very distinctively different aspects to it i think especially in the structure of the pelvis um so Birds were around while the dinosaurs were around. So right at the end of the Cretaceous, uh, just before that mega extinction event, uh, there were birds flying in the air while dinosaurs were walking about on the ground. So they were contemporaneous. But there is a general consensus now that all dinosaurs were covered in either feathers or like a downy down. Uh, I've seen a lot of uh, articles on the period in which dinosaurs were the reigning animals on the planet was a period of massive evolutionary competition, um, especially towards the end of the Mesozoic era. Uh, Resources were dwindling and competition was increasing. And it sort of makes sense that you had plumage and you had a lot more um, display uh, going on, as you might find in a, a tropical rainforest where there's a massive amount of competition. I can very well imagine most dinosaurs probably did have lots of display plumage, and the evolution of uh, flight perhaps came from just having so much plumage that it actually aided gliding when chasing prey, perhaps. Who, who knows? But uh, it doesn't seem to me to be a complete leap to say that uh, maybe they weren't just shiny slimy and scaly and in fact they were covered in feathers again feathers are are not a 
feathers aren't something that fossilizes particularly easily. Uh, bones are much better at fossilizing. But then having said that, apparently chicken feathers are indestructible and they never deteriorate. So, you know, we have that to think about. But bones will show whether an animal had feathers, according to experts. Um, feathers don't attach to bones, though. Feathers are like um, hairs. They're adapted hairs. Or you could say hairs or adapted feathers. They're a, a, a dermatological phenomenon and structure. They never attach to bones. It's possible that I'm misremembering this, but uh, I listened to a talk given by a, a really smart guy who was talking about how the spine of a feathered animal will have these indentations in them, and apparently modern birds have these same indentations. All right. Interesting. Um, certainly, so there are fossils where you see the impressions of feathers along the spine of the animal, uh, which gives you the impression that you know there is definitely something there. It, it, it's, it seems obvious to me that there's going to be something like that, uh, and that the the external um, structures on a dinosaur could have been widely varied. Uh, I think you probably might not have seen feathered dinosaurs in the oceans, but uh, certainly on the land. For various, you know, feathers can be very useful. They can shade you from the sun. They can increase the amount of air circulating around your body. Their display purposes, gliding. You know, they're a really useful evolutionary adaptation. And I can imagine they certainly were around at the time. Um, and, and you know, I think uh, the, smaller, the smaller you are as a dinosaur, perhaps the more useful um, feathers might have been in terms of functionality. Uh, so... How big did dinosaurs get? I think we should talk about the different sizes. We've already mentioned that you have very small ones and you have very big ones. Yes, I was reading something uh, about how the meat-eating dinosaurs were the ones that survived the uh, noodle incident because um, they're smaller. Vegetarian animals, apparently, um, need much larger stomachs or much larger bodies or something like that. Do you know anything about this? Well, I think uh, from what I've read, the very large dinosaurs, like the sauropods, which included Diplodocus and Brachiosaurus, and however you want to pronounce it, perhaps it's Brachiosaurus, the very, very, really massive, huge dinosaurs, uh, the ones that get up there in the sort of, uh, you know, 50 ton plus area, uh, there are lots of theories as to how they got so big. Um, certainly all of the big ones were vegetarians. And that's because there was so much vegeta ve vegetation around and it's so easy to uh, to consume and to utilize. Uh, and also the, the advantages to being really big is that you're, the, the numbers of predators sort of dwindles away. If you get that huge, you're, you're not easy prey. Also, they could have had, uh, they could have been quite lightweight. Uh, these really large dinosaurs actually had, you know, bird-like hollow bones. Or honeycomb bones. So, uh, you know, they didn't weigh as much as a, an elephant at the same scale would weigh, um, for instance. And uh, the food was uh, not just hyper abundant, but also it was a lot easier. There, there was less cellulose and, uh, you know, the grasses hadn't evolved when the dinosaurs were around. They're much uh, easier to eat fern-like structures that broke apart easier and you had to chew less and digest less so uh you know eating food was easier as so you could eat more of it and spend more time utilizing the energy rather than chewing uh the larger ones could have been supported by water perhaps you know they were all waders you know who knows it could have been just all swamps and marshlands and uh very few of them actually stood on hard ground and fully supported their weight uh, and then there's the atmosphere. There could have been significantly more oxygen, for instance, so they could oxygenate more muscles faster and more efficiently, so they were able to grow more muscle and be bigger. So that those are some of the explanations for the size of the really big ones, but certainly they will have been, just as, as is the case now, uh, the largest animals were vegetarians uh, and the smaller ones were meat eaters, uh, probably arguably smarter as well because they have to hunt. Yeah, the uh, T-Rex was a meat eater, and uh, and that was pretty darned big. It was pretty big. It was nowhere near the size of the sauropods, but it was certainly big and got up to about five tons. Yes, this brings me on to something um, else that I'm interested to talk about, and that's the um, a kind of misconception uh, with the size of dinosaurs. You and I went to, or have been to, uh, Nebworth Park, 
uh, Nebworth House, rather, um, where they have this, um, I don't know what you'd call it, like a diorama of um, prehistoric world or the whatever world. Um, and it's populated by these life-size replica dinosaurs. And I think almost none of them um, were as large as a modern elephant or have the same, as much mass as a modern elephant. I think it said on some placard next to each of them, um, which I think is something that people don't really appreciate. Um, we actually still have these huge animals um, that are extant. Well, I mean, today. there was a vast spectrum of sizes with dinosaurs. You know, they ranged from smaller than a chicken all the way up to, uh, you know, really huge. The Argentinosaurus, for instance, was uh, 14 African elephants in size. Yes, absolutely huge. 77 tons. And there could have been bigger ones. Titanosaur, for instance, could have been heavier. They didn't have that one at uh, Nebworth House. It's too expensive to make the model. Yeah, you, you want to build you want to build models of smaller dinosaurs because it costs you less. There's a, there's a little crazy golf uh, place near where I live, and uh, they have a Diplodocus. That was very big. <laughs> I mean, that was a humongous dinosaur. They have a life size Diplodocus at a little crazy golf uh, co course, and uh, yeah, it's absolutely humongous. I mean, they were really really massively big. Nothing yet discovered is as big as a blue whale, or nothing can nothing yet discovered is as large as the largest blue whale that has been discovered that is a truly gargantuan creature and may well have been the largest single living uh animal with a a, a vertebral column ever to have lived on this planet all i'm uh, saying so far. all i'm saying is people shouldn't be moping around thinking oh god what's the point of living there are no large animals anymore when there are there are uh, African ele elephants are absolutely humongous and considerably larger than the Indian um, elephants. The basking shark, which is uh, a local to uh, the UK, is an absolutely massive fish. Uh, one that hasn't changed for almost 200 million years, by the way. So that's like a living uh, fossil. Um, and uh, yeah, there are lots of big beasts now uh, in a slightly different way. But uh, certainly the largest land animals that have ever lived lived during the Mesozoic era. Uh, there are lots of them, but there are far more smaller dinosaurs. Now, the T-Rex, evidently, um, from what I read, uh, there is no real reason why it would stop growing. It could just keep growing until it got twice the size of the largest one that had ever lived. It's <laughs> It only stopped growing because it died. But uh, some of the dinosaurs were extremely long-lived, and uh, there didn't seem to be any upper limit to the amount of... Uh, girth they could attain um you know radically different animals that had a different environment and you know they're, they're completely you know they, they diverged from uh our selection pressures quite considerably because the environment was so different um so there's also the question of where the dinosaurs lived where, where were they uh, again it's hard to get into your mind just how vast the the length of time is we're talking about here you know when you talk about hundreds of millions of years you talk about mountains appearing and disappearing and uh, you know huge rivers just wiggling around and coastlines converging into mountain ranges it's it's just insane how the planet has changed structurally over such a such amount of time uh, so the answer to where dinosaurs lived is well everywhere everywhere now you know we had di land born dinosaurs marching about in the middle of the what we now know as the atlantic ocean so you know they were everywhere and because the the plates of the planet the tectonic plates have been shifting about i can imagine there are dinosaur fossils to be found in places that are utterly uninhabitable now so perhaps there are dinosaur fossils in buried in ice perhaps there are fossils underneath the ocean who knows but uh the earth has changed greatly ever since um gondwana land which was a single land mass you know over 500 million years ago um all the way to now where we have quite a fractured um land mass and land masses and islands uh, with quite a lot of ocean i think there are significantly smaller oceans uh, hundreds of millions of years ago so i understand 
Uh, so the dinosaurs lived everywhere. Uh, but the atmospheres, that, that always fascinates me. I mean, what was it like? You know, you watch movies like Jurassic Park and you think, okay, well, they've genetically engineered these animals to come back and live and stomp about. But could they have stomped about? Were there not changes in the air? I mean, would they be able to breathe our air? Would we be able to breathe the air as it was 150 million years ago? I somehow doubt it. I can imagine going back 150 million years, it would be maybe ludicrously um, humid. You know, it would just be like breathing water, perhaps. Uh, poison gases, who knows? And uh, maybe it would be just too hot for us. We wouldn't be able to stand it. I think uh, environment suits would be would be required if we were ever to go back. I think they sort of tinkered with the uh, genetics of dinosaurs. In Jurassic Park. It's, it's, it's only a film. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. There's a new one, Jurassic World. And I think there's a little bit more science to explain exactly how they've done things. But I haven't seen that yet. Yes. Um, that's like the biggest grossing film of all time or something like that. Uh, I don't have any current interest in seeing that well there's the enduring uh, interest of dinosaurs uh, i think that's fascinating in itself how uh, how everybody is so fascinated especially children um i'm always struck by just how interested children are in dinosaurs and i think there are there are a lot of potential theories for this and i think the front runner for me is that they are monsters there are a lot of them and they are gone they are no longer on the earth therefore they are not frightening to children children are happy to talk about dinosaurs that are monsters because they know there isn't going to be one in their closet because they're extinct so it's great it's a monster you can talk about i think that's one of the the appeals of dinosaurs and also the fact that they're they're you know they all they're different they're specialized they have different skill sets uh, they're like top trumps you know what's the biggest dinosaur what's the fastest dinosaur what's the smartest dinosaur yeah, that's quite interesting as well. So, uh, they are monsters that did once live and roam around the planet. So, I mean, that's fascinating enough to get them in into the media and into the movies. Uh, and I've certainly seen a lot of really good um, dinosaur models in in special effects in movies, and it's getting better and better. And I'm sure this new Jurassic Park movie will be absolutely astounding. But uh, you know, when you see because they try they try and be a little bit accurate, so they get the sizes you know roughly correct so when you see the tyrannosaurus rex in jurassic park chasing down the humans and you just imagine what that must be like actually having something like that with those teeth chasing you uh, to eat you um it can outrun you it's 13 meters long uh that's a terrifying prospect when you think about it but uh we're safe we're safe in the by the fact that we're uh we're you know millions of years uh after them no absolutely so tyrannosaurus yes, rex i watched uh, a clip of jurassic park um the original jurassic park recently um and the special effects are none too impressive um in this day and age i mean they were mind-blowing i'm sure in 1993 or however old the film is um but we are just so used to just mind melting special effects these days that Watching Jurassic Park is an interesting experience, just how we were impressed by that. It's just so, the dinosaurs look so basic. Yeah, I think that's just, you know, any 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 film that is heavy on special effects uh, probably won't age too well. Uh, and, you know, I think they use, they're heavy on the, the special effects in Jurassic Park for sure. So, uh, yeah, that just instantaneously ages it. Unlike uh, the use of special effects in films, you know, very, very subtle or, or you know, if you use special effects sparingly, then you can get away with the aging process, I think, and uh, your movie can always look good. 2001 A Space Odyssey always springs to mind when I think about special effects aging well. But with dinosaurs being, you know, animals, uh, it's going to be hard. You know, even cutting edge special effects, you can always tell that it's a... Uh, that it's a, uh, it doesn't exist. And the actors are actually looking at a, a small couple of guys taped together, all wearing green. I don't know about that. I think um, special effects are pretty convincing right now. And surely they won't be too long to go before we have genuinely convincing dinosaurs. I th we're virtually there, surely. I mean, Jar Jar Binks was pretty convincing, I thought. I've, uh, I've erased him from my uh, memory. I don't know what you mean.
but yeah, no, these 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 dinosaur movies that I can remember were certainly more than ten years ago. So you would hope things have come along, which and, and there haven't been that many dinosaur. Yeah, movies so I was just reason. just thinking that which dinosaur movies are you talking about? Well, I suppose the Jurassic Park movies. Uh, there are a few other dinosaur movies that I can't remember, but um, I remember existed at the time. Uh, dinosaurs have always been a thing, but I think the problem with dinosaurs in movies is that it's expensive to convincingly portray a dinosaur you have to use a lot of computer graphics and computer graphics is labor intensive and very expensive so. and animatronics yeah so yeah I, i've certainly seen a few dinosaur movies with you know uh, marionettes or suits uh, that were very good so it can be done without computer graphics it depends uh, where your imagination is at at the time of watching did you ever see that exhibition at the natural history museum about Two years ago, three years ago, maybe. You must have taken Lucy to it. They had this animatronic dinosaur that was just mind-blowing. Yeah, the, that exhibition is still there. Uh, I went uh, a couple of months ago, and they have a full-size Tyrannosaurus Rex, uh, which is very good. Um, and uh, they have uh, the skeletons of quite a number of dinosaurs. And indeed, they do seem smaller than you're expecting. You, know, you look at the Iguanodon and the Allosaurus, and you think, hang on a minute, they're not that huge. I can imagine putting a saddle on that and then riding it about. Uh, but then they have the leg of one of the sauropods, you know, one of the really big ones. And you think, oh, hang on a minute, these things really were ridiculously huge. I mean, <laughs> they, they were just insane, absolutely insane. Uh and and indeed, in that exhibition, they have a, a few very small dinosaurs. I think they might have a true dawn, and I don't know whether or not they have a theropod, but they certainly have chicken-sized dinosaurs. So, you know, it's absolutely certain that the vast majority of reptiles at the time were tiny. <laughs> but we're not interested in the small ones. No. And again, yeah, the, the bigger ones fossilize better, and they're always more impressive. But... Uh, but they're no longer around. Dinosaurs are, are not here. They really are all in the past. There aren't any surviving dinosaurs, uh, discounting the controversy that are birds. Uh, but why? Why are they not around any longer? Are there any underground caves that someone could be hiding in, perhaps? Or, or are they all gone? And what happened? Well, some liars and charlatans um, insist that dinosaurs uh, haven't died out. And um, they are still living amongst us. Well, there's one in a, in a lake in Scotland that seems to elude detection. Yes, and despite that being debunked time and time and time again, um, it seems like uh, just every year some outspoken creationist will then come out and, and insist that the Loch Ness Monster is proof that dinosaurs were not only living within the last 6,000 years, but they, uh, they are still alive now. Well, I mean, whether or not that's true, um, it certainly seems that the vast majority of dinosaurs are dead. And the reason why they died is mostly down to a rock striking the Earth really fast about 65-ish million years ago. So this is a so-called extinction event that occurred uh, and there have been many extinction events, not just rocks hitting the planet, but also water levels and, and, and other phenomena. But uh, 65 million years ago, a roughly 10 kilometer wide chunk of rock, or a meteorite as it's called when it strikes the Earth, hit near the uh, peninsula of uh, Mexico, the Yucatan Peninsula, uh, which when you look at on a map, it actually does look like it's describing, you know, a significant part of a circle. <laughs> it looks as though something really large hit right there. Um, I don't think it was quite as large as that curve described on the map, but uh, 10 kilometers wide, uh, at not a glancing blow, a dead-on strike. And that was enough to vaporize the water, throw up a massive plume of dust, and completely change the atmosphere of the entire planet uh, and this killed you know a vast percentage of the amount of life on the planet uh, not as much as a previous extinction event uh, which killed 95 percent of all life but this one was a big one and it certainly changed the environment enough to kill off all the dinosaurs which uh, needed more sunlight and more green vegetation and uh, you know uh, a generally uh, warmer climate but uh, 
the ensuing dust cloud blocked out the sun, probably reduced the temperature of the planet's surface significantly and enough to uh, enable the the um, competitive advantages of smaller animals, especially the mammals, uh, of which we are a member, us humans. And uh, it was the mammals' time uh, in the sunshine uh, when, it, when, it, when it finally appeared after the dust clouds all precipitated. So uh, that was the end of the dinosaurs and the end of the Mesozoic era. Um, a 10-kilometer rock just hit the Earth. So when you think about how many rocks there are out there, uh, and you think about the fact that this wasn't a one-off, there has been other rocks that have struck the Earth, uh, when is the next one? That's what we're all wondering now. And uh, will we be able to detect it before it hits us? How much notice will we get? A day? A week? Uh, a month? Uh, where will we go if uh, a, a rock is hurtling towards us? Uh, these, are, these are things I don't particularly want to think about, quite frankly. And if we were to be struck by a rock again, could the dinosaurs come back? Surely not, but who knows? You know, that's evolution. If you change the environment, uh, then if there is any life about, uh, and there are selection pressures, and there are differences between individuals, then uh, things will happen. Uh, you will get lots of different... Uh, you, you'll get diversity, basically. So, you know, perhaps something will hit the planet, kill absolutely everything on the surface of the planet, but the little creatures that live next to the black smokers at the bottom of the oceans, perhaps. They'll have their day and be able to move away from their uh, their high, their super hot vents and uh, move onto the land, and, uh, and that's the way it'll work. But uh, who knows? We have millions and millions and millions and hundreds of millions of years to play with. Uh, in fact, five billion years before, I think, the sun turns into a red giant and absorbs the earth. So who knows what life forms could occur? And uh, maybe we will see the the like of the dinosaurs again. Um, some little notable pop facts about dinosaurs that I was able to dig up. The smartest dinosaur, um, so the scientists think, could have been the true dawn. Uh, this was, it hunted in packs. Um, it was very small, very fast. Uh, it nurtured its young for perhaps, I mean, how they know this, I have no idea, but it nurtured its young for longer than other dinosaurs, so investing more time into developing their smaller litter of dinosaur babies. Uh, the heaviest dinosaur could well have been the Argentinosaurus, um, 77 tons, uh, close to 14 African elephants. Uh, there could have been larger um, species. The Titanosaur uh, could have been heavier. Uh, the fastest dinosaur could well have been an ornithomid, or ornithomidid, very difficult to pronounce. Ornithomimids. These were ostrich-like dinosaurs, and they could perhaps hit up to 25 miles an hour, which is quite fast. The most popular dinosaur by far, certainly in terms of marketing, is Tyrannosaurus rex, and this is a dinosaur that lived right at the very end of the the reign of the dinosaurs. It was it was there. It saw uh, that meteorite. Um, yeah, so, you know, it was not so much jungles and forests, more sort of uh, plains and uh, deserts and noxious gases and volcanic activity. I mean, if, if, if that meteorite never hit the planet, probably the dinosaurs would have been killed off by all the volcanic activity that was occurring at the time I mean, it really was the whole the, it was a bad situation they're they're born to to die these dinosaurs uh, the longest named dinosaur so far is the and i'll give this a go a micro this is or which which means tiny thicko so micro tiny pachy well, is sort head. of like a thick thick well pachy is thick uh, seth's seth head is head yeah, so Pachycef means thick head, and micro is, is tiny. Um, so there you are. And uh, I'll just get a little mention in there of the Cambrian explosion. Uh, I, I often hear people talking about the Cambrian explosion, explosion at the same time as dinosaurs. The Cambrian explosion happened 540 million years ago, so well before the dinosaurs. Um, it's a completely different topic, uh, which we're not going to cover here. So... 
if we've covered absolutely everything there is to cover about dinosaurs, I think we should probably wrap up. Well, I was going to just briefly talk about, or we should briefly discuss, um, the people, or the small group of people, who deny that dinosaurs have ever existed. I mean, I, I fail to see how that makes any sense. And if, I mean, it, are these people even worth talking to? How do they explain fossils? Well, that's easy. They have a book which explains everything. Um, there are two different types of um, charlatan in this, uh, in this game. There are those that simply just deny dinosaurs have ever happened because the Bible doesn't mention them, so they didn't happen, dummy. Um, and then there's the Ken Ham types um, that do actual somersaults to try and work the fossils and all this um, science confirming of dinosaurs uh, into the Bible and these various different things. Um, and these people, they kind of are worth listening to because they have such power and sway. You know, people um, are duped and they want to be duped by these charlatans. I, I think you'll get that sort of, you, you'll always get a grouping of people with a similar sort of agenda in every area of science and discovery. I mean, they're never going to go away. I think the percentages are, are, are lowering, however. I remember watching a a video of Kent Hovind talking about um, how fossils aren't as old as the scientists would have you believe. And he, he thought the reason, the explanation for the layers of sedimentary rock is down to a phenomenon called hydrodynamic sorting. And this was mostly after the Great Flood. Uh, you had a huge amount of water that flooded the whole world. And um, all of that water allowed the various rock types and, and whatnot to um, sort into layers over a very short period of time, like 40 days or something. But, uh, you know, it's all down to evidence. And uh, although all of us, of course, do defer to the experts, I think um, the evidence is fairly overwhelming. Even to a lay person, it seems likely that dinosaurs did exist. And it certainly seems likely that they existed a very, very long time ago indeed. And the reasons why they don't exist any longer is because of environmental factors. I completely accept all of that. And it would take uh, amazing evidence to, um, to force me to think otherwise. But I will, if such amazing evidence uh, is, is put forward. Uh, so you have been listening to eclecticist.co.uk. We have a supporting webpage at eclecticist.co.uk, uh, where you can pop in some feedback into a contact form. You can see information on previous shows and download those shows. Um, and you can also see information on up and coming shows. And I believe our next show could very well be, although this is yet to be confirmed, extra in extra terrestrial intelligence. That's what we're going to be talking about. Are we alone or are we alone? Uh, this is yet to be confirmed, but I think that's what it's going to be about. Our outro music of choice this week is uh, something uh, that's freely available and royalty-free and uh, sort of open source so we don't get sued. It is Dinosaur by Orange Corp. It's sort of an alternative indie pop band from Western Massachusetts, and uh, we think it's really great. Well, thank you very much, and we'll see you next time.
Stuck on a space. 